The first time I heard the wail of a mother's cry over her dead child's body, shot in the head because of his father's gang affiliation, I felt my heart stop. It is a battle cry that pierces the air, that tears through all that is human and spreads sheer anguish to anyone that bears witness to it. I am an emergency physician at one of the bloodiest hospitals in Chicago. And on weekend nights, my office turns from hospital to bloodstained morgue. Most of these victims are men, and it is mostly men that are doing the shooting. But it's the women, the mothers, the sisters, the daughters, the wives, who are left behind to be caught in the crossfire. They occasionally are victims of violence themselves, usually as targets of retribution, or more often just as innocent bystanders, but they are always the ones left to pick up the broken pieces of a broken family. Because it is a man's battle, but it's a woman's war. Now, when we think of gang violence, we normally think of gang violence in what the media shows us. And what the media shows us is usually headlines like this. 65 shot in Chicago over Labor Day weekend. 47 shot in Chicago over weekend as totals near 2,300 for year. And Chicago 2016 homicide count surpasses the total for 2015. What these headlines fail to recognize, though, are the women and children left behind in a world of devastation with no more economic means, no protection, no safety, no resources, no support. What they fail to recognize are the women and children who in the blink of an eye have lost everything and who in the pull of a trigger are left to fend for themselves. Cycles of oppression for women, like human trafficking, quickly become the only lifeboats for these women just to stay afloat. Now, most of you have never met a gang member, and most of you never will. But here's why you should care. Because gang violence is not an issue restricted just to the death toll in specific communities of specific people. Gang violence is the inciting event for crimes against humanity for women that we as women have long ago said that we would battle. Gang violence breeds a desperate situation for women that necessarily perpetuates a cycle of violence and oppression and limits the advancement of women. And because we have already targeted certain movements that we as women will always battle, like domestic violence, rape, or human trafficking, gang violence will necessarily become our movement as well. Because again, gang violence is the inciting event for crimes against humanity for women. Now, this is not a new idea. Last winter, there was a movie that came out called Chirac. It was written and produced by Spike Lee, who is from Chicago. And the name is a play on Chicago and Iraq, primarily the setting of Chicago and the violence of Iraq. In this movie, based on the South Side of Chicago, it features the rampant violence that we see there. Far from focusing on women's oppression, however, it proposes a peace for pussy movement where the women will withhold sex from their men until the men agree to stop fighting. When I heard about this movie, I could hear the cries of that mother once again. I thought to the countless women that I see night after night in my trauma bay who again sob after the men who have gotten shot. And I thought of the women who are suddenly thrust into an isolated bubble of responsibility that they have had no setting for and no preparation for that have happened suddenly in just the pull of someone's finger. Because what I see is not women who lack a will for peace, what I see are women that lack support and resources to ever combat it. In Chirac, the women are heroines because they won't play until the men put the guns away. 
but in real life, they are heroines because they have to be just to survive. Now, it's not just the women who are misportrayed often in media about gang violence. It's also the men. The gang members are far from being just testosterone-laden gang beggars who are just a little too trigger happy. The Guns and Knives Club is our main clientele at my hospital, and we see them day after day, and we get to know them. So we don't know them as the Latin kings or the Black Disciples or the Almighty Gaylords. We know them as Jason with asthma, Sean with appendicitis, and Jorge who just won't wear a seatbelt. And we take care of them. We take care of their kids' runny noses. We take care of their mother's cellulitis. We take care of their sister's COPD, and we take care of their wives' pregnancies. So one day, Jason with asthma comes into my emergency room with a bad pneumonia. I spent hours on him trying to get him well enough to be able to go home, but to no avail. So when I went to Jason and I told him, "We need to keep you in the hospital for a couple days just for IV antibiotics and for some oxygen," he jerked his head towards mine, looked me dead in the eyes, and yanked out his IV. And as blood flowed down his arm, he said to me, "I have a new baby at home, and I'm not sending one night away from my family." Then he signed his release form and walked out the door. Because you see, Jason was a gang member, but first he was a family man. Mere weeks later, I saw Jason again. This time, he came by ambulance. Lights flashing, sirens blaring, shot in the chest. And Jason still had pneumonia the day he died. That is the end of the story for Jason with asthma, but it was also the first day that I met the woman and the baby that he left behind. Her name was Michaela, and I had to be the one to break the news to her. And I, as I looked her in the eyes and uttered those words to her, I saw her entire world shatter. For Michaela, I saw that she had lost everything. And that there was no grief that to describe what she was feeling at that time. But as I tried to meet her eyes, I recognized not only the profound sadness, but also fear—a shocking, utter fear that at the time I didn't have an explanation for. But it started to make sense when I met Michaela once again, almost a year later. Michaela was brought back to me a year later. Pregnant in handcuffs and by the cops, she had been assaulted on a drug sale gone bad, and too injured to flee. She was the only one left there when the police had arrived. They had brought her in to try to stitch some wounds and check her out to make sure she was medically cleared. We were really just the medical detour on her way to jail. And as I cleaned her up and took a look at her. She told me what life had become. In the aftermath of Jason's death, she had found herself in increasing danger. She lacked the protection of Jason's status within his gang, but still had an affiliation to it in the eyes of rivaling gangs. She knew to a lot of the rivals that she was just a loose end that they would be sure to try to cut. Michaela had to find daycare for her child so that she could go and try to find a job. The problem is, in the area that she lived, the gang lines are so clearly demarcated that crossing them, even to go to daycare, is reason enough to shoot you. Pushing a stroller does not buy you immunity. Police had approached Michaela, offering her snitch protection. Safety from them in exchange for inside intelligence about gang activity. She declined it, knowing that the irony is, snitch protection is a death sentence if anyone from any gang ever finds out. And to be honest, even being approached by the cops had put a target on her back. 
with ever increasing danger and more and more limited economic devices, Michaela did what she had to. She reaffiliated with another gang member, she got pregnant, and she found her way in sex and drug trafficking. Michaela was raped multiple times on the job, but to her, she had a job. For Michaela, the way to get out was to get back in. Now, this is not a unique story for women in this community. Gang violence in and of itself breeds death and debilitation, but too often we forget about the women who are left behind. For Michaela, gang violence had not only taken away all of her economic means and the life she had always dreamed for herself, it also took away every opportunity she had ever wanted for her own advancement. For Michaela, she had always dreamed of going to beauty school but there is no beauty school in jail. Worse, these sort of cycles of oppression are perpetuated, not just within one life, but generationally. For Michaela's child, she too is at a higher risk of teenage pregnancy, drug and alcohol abuse, dropping out of school. She's at a higher risk for human trafficking, gang violence, and domestic abuse. Michaela's child was only a baby when that shot was fired, but it is a shot that will continue to color her childhood, her adolescence, and her entire adult life. The death toll of gang violence is in and of itself a problem, but too often we see it as a region or class-restricted issue. We see it as a Englewood issue or a Washington Park issue or a Garfield Park issue, but never as a North Shore issue, or a Gold Coast issue, or even an Oak Park issue. How often have you heard someone say something like, I'm glad the gangs are fighting. Maybe they'll just kill each other off and we'll all be at peace. Rarely do leaders, community leaders, government leaders, philanthropists, interact with gang members on any sort of meaningful level. And as a result, almost never do they see the shattered worlds of women that happen as a result. But when the shots settle, it is the women who are left behind. When the shots settle, it is the women who are left to fend for themselves. It is the women who are left on an isolated island of responsibility. And it is the women left to fear for worse coming for themselves and for their families. But we, as women, understand family. And family is the unifying force from the gang violence of Englewood all the way to the women of Oak Park. Because of a global dedication to family, whatever form that may take, just as we weep if a family member or a loved one passes from a heart attack, these women wail when they see their men in my trauma bay. And just as we would do anything for our families, these women literally do anything. Selling drugs, selling contraband, selling information, and yes, selling themselves for their families. We as women need to rally and unify around these women to see their plight of gang violence as our plight of gang violence. We as women need to recognize gang violence as the roadblock to the advancement of women that it is. And we as women need to empathize and understand the situation that these women have been thrust into rather than judge and condemn their actions. And we as women need to instead recognize the unapparent bravery in their choices. Because it is a man's battle, but we as women will win the war. Thank you.